Today we're going to talk about the Buffalo Springfield, one of the most influential bands of the mid to late 60s. And though they were only together about two years, they left behind three very excellent albums. The first of which we're going to talk about here on Pop Goes the 60s. Buffalo Springfield formed in April 1966 in Los Angeles. Fate had brought them together. They were a collection of acquaintances and friends that had performed together over the previous year. And they were fairly new at their instruments. Some of them had started writing and they came very quickly to forming a band. And within a week of forming, they got their first gig at the Troubadour in Los Angeles. This led to a couple other important shows and they got a seven week residency at the Whiskey A Go Go. And this, during this time, they really honed their craft, playing live every night. And based on the strength of those performances, they got their record deal with ATCO, which is a subsidiary of Atlantic. Now the Springfield was comprised of five main players, Stephen Stills, Neil Young, Richie Fure, Bruce Palmer, and Dewey Martin. Their backgrounds were a mixture of folk, rock, um, maybe a little bit of blues, but uh, together they had, I guess at the time you would have called them a folk rock band, though they were different sounding. They had something, they had something different because they were essentially singer-songwriters, at least three of them, and Buffalo Springfield, in retrospect, probably launched that whole singer-songwriter genre that came, became so popular in the late 60s and early 70s. So that combined with loud guitars. This was one of the early three guitar bands and that's the sound that the record companies heard when they first scouted them. So things started happening very fast for the Buffalo Springfield. Uh, just prior to the record contract they changed management. They went with two guys called uh, Charlie Green and Brian Stone. They had been managing Sonny and Cher and really dazzled the group with their limousines and, and their flashy uh, business attire. And they also sold the, the group on uh, their production skills in the studio. So after a few months, the band was ready to record its first single, which was Nowadays Clancy Can't Even Sing. Cause nowadays Clancy can even sing. Nowadays Clancy Can't Even Sing was a little bit of an odd choice for a single because it was slow and it was um, introspective. It was over three minutes, which was unusual for a single, hard to get airplay, but uh, that won out over Stephen Still's Go and Say Goodbye, which had a real bluegrass intro and had a country feel to it. Now what the band was trying to do with this album was to capture their live sound. Most of these songs on here, these are all songs they were playing live. And as I mentioned before, they had this three guitar lineup, which was unique. And you can hear the hard ro driving rock on songs like Burned, Leave, and Pay the Price. Been burned, and with both feet on the ground. Well, I've heard this story once before, and I know what the tears are for. Now, the band was set up at this point to basically feature Richie Fure on lead vocals, though Steve Stills has several lead vocals. Neil Young's voice was not considered commercial enough during this first album, but he started to get more confident as this record was being produced, and he wanted his face time. So, this record is split up between Neil Young and Steven Stills' songs. Richie Fure didn't get any of his songs on the album. And some of the songs are a little more uh, introspective, like, I, like nowadays Clancy can't even sing. For instance, Flying on the Ground is Wrong and Out of My Mind. But if crying and holding on and flying on the ground is wrong Out of my mind And I just can't take it Now the songs that are could be consider, considered more folk rock would be Hot Dusty Roads and I would say Everybody's Wrong. Everybody's Wrong is a particular favorite of mine. Surprising things for a kid. 
case of the blues. So the first single charted poorly. It charted about number 25 in Los Angeles, but number 110 nationwide. And when that song didn't chart well, they panicked a little bit. The second song they released as a single was Burned, the Neil Young song, but that song missed the charts entirely. One of the songs on here called uh, Sit Down, I Think I Love You, which is a Steve Still song, that was a song that was covered the following year by a group called the Mojo Men, a San Francisco group. Clearly the most commercial song on this record. I think they should have released that as a single, but I, I suspect they did not because Steve Stills had sold the publishing on that song and he wouldn't have, not, wouldn't have made really much money on that. He'd make more money on one of his songs he owned the publishing on. And these guys are very aware of publishing and getting the more songs of theirs they had on the album, the more money you make. Sit down, I think I love you any way I'd like to try. What really harmed the band was that once they were enjoying the recording process, but once they started listening to the playbacks, they realized that Green and Stone were not producers. And the sound just sounded dull. The bass was like a thud. It didn't capture their live performances at all. And some of the production, they, there was, I think they were recording this on a four track machine. So they weren't, some of the, they didn't have enough tracks to overdub backing vocals and some guitar solos. So they were so upset with this uh, record that they went to the label and said, hey, we want to record the whole thing over again. To which the label said, well, no, <laughs> but we'll let you mix the mono. So Steve Stills and Neil Young mixed the mono themselves. Uh, the stereo version is the Charlie Green, Brian Stone production. And per, I think the difference is negligible. I've listened to both. This CD came out in 1992 with both versions for easy comparison if you want to comp compare. Most people, I think, prefer the mono. It's, got, it's a little punchier, but I prefer a couple tracks of the stereo because I can hear more instrumentation. There's a little more separation. For instance, on the song, Everybody's Wrong, I can hear another guitar in there, which I prefer. But like I said, the difference is negligible. And generally speaking, the reviews on the album, though Sharp reviews did notice the amateur's production, the reviews were generally positive. And they said, this is something new, a new sound, and clearly we've got some great writers in this band. Now you may notice this hype sticker on here that says, including their big new hit for what it's worth. The original album did not have that song on it. It had a song called Baby Don't Scold Me. And they were rushing to get that album out at Christmas, so they were done with it in, in November. Well, Steve Stills, uh, for what it's worth, that song was recorded shortly after that, and it was released in early 67. So, for what it's worth, it was really intended for the, the group's second album, which never really materialized at the time. So what ATCO did is they re-released re this album with the big hit on it. That's when this album really started to sell. I think it's time we stop, children, what's that sound? Everybody look what's going down. Well, that covers their first album. Stay tuned for more videos on their next couple of albums, plus more, here on Pop Goes the 60s.